William Fielding Ogburn, 1933. The report also looked at the impact of the new immigrants on society. The ideas of scientific racism still influenced the dialogue. As soon as any agreement can be reached about the method by which undesirables can be selected from the population, they should be prevented from propagating. Warren Thompson. Recent Social Trends was published in 1933, but it was no longer of use to Hoover, who had been voted out of office, held accountable for the onset of what would become America's greatest depression. The worst was yet to come. We've become accustomed to the images of bread lines, the apple sellers on the corners, but pictures cannot begin to capture the depth of the crisis. For that, we need to look at the desperate numbers of devastation, and we will. But first, consider one story that has come to epitomize the depression experience, the tragic saga of the Dust Bowl migration to California. Most everyone who thinks about American history thinks they know this one cold. It was first immortalized by the memorable photographs of Dorothea Lange and others. John Steinbeck's classic novel, The Grapes of Wrath, and the movie that followed have been etched on American chords of memory. Steinbeck's heroes, the beaten down Joad family, became stand-ins for the 375,000 Okies and Arkies who headed west in the 1930s. Many of them came across the desert on Route 66 through these mountain passes seeking the lush San Joaquin Valley. Who were they? What really happened to them? As Americans were told over and over again, these were uneducated, dirt poor refugee farmers blown away by the Dust Bowl, pushed to California to work as peasant pea pickers facing harsh white-on-white -white racism, right? Well, to begin, take that matter of the Dust Bowl itself. So much of, uh, of what we think that migration was all about is, is wrong, starting with the name. The whole concept of a Dust Bowl migration is, an, is a wonderful misnomer. Most of the people had nothing to do with the Dust Bowl region. Um, most really weren't uh, victims of the drought either. A lot of them weren't even farmers. There was indeed a Dust Bowl, but almost all of these migrants came from areas well to the east of it, mainly from parts of Oklahoma, Texas, Missouri, and Arkansas. And most did not match the demographics of the Joad family of Steinbeck's novel. Less than half the migrants, just 43% were farmers or farm laborers. Almost one in six was a professional, a proprietor, or a white collar employee. About two in five were blue collar workers. Accordingly, their prospects differed from those of the Joads. About a third went into the valleys of California that are associated with the Grapes of Wrath, two-thirds into the cities, especially Los Angeles, where they found industrial jobs, and some of them were white-collar workers. So the imagery is mis misleading. It's much too negative. It creates an impression of great misery when there was certainly uh, difficulties and there were people who suffered tremendously but the majority story is much more positive. For most people even the journey itself the great westward exodus was not the hard road described in Steinbeck's novel. This wasn't covered wagons this was two days with camping along the way or stopping at motels in Arizona and for many people not 
unpleasant days at all, any more than it is today. For those who ran out of money, of course, there could be difficulties. But for most people, it's just a drive. It's not that families like the Jodes didn't exist. They did. And those were real people that Dorothea Lang captured on film. But artists and the media often shape their data, just like social scientists. Some of the rural Okies and Arkies faced deep-seated discrimination and scorn when they arrived in California. But perhaps they had the last laugh. And I'm proud to be an Okie from the school. They brought their country culture with them, which has survived and flourished in California, across America, and around the world. In Muskogee, Oklahoma, USA. The Okies and Arkies were not the only people who picked up and moved, fleeing the hurricane of the Depression. The 1930s is the only decade for which we have numbers from the 18th century forward when net migration to the United States was negative. People actually left the country. Several hundred thousand Mexicans and Mexican-Americans also left the United States. Some unable to find jobs in Depression America or facing widespread discrimination saw greater opportunity back in Mexico. Others were repatriated often against their will. Well, the Great Depression was the worst economic crisis in American history by a very large margin. And it's almost impossible to convey the dimensions of such a terrible economic crisis. The best way is with data. They tell a story beyond anything we've experienced in recent times. Take unemployment. From 1950 to 2000, the annual unemployment rate never even hit double digits, and when it got close, it was only briefly. But from 1930 to 1940, for more than a decade, unemployment in America averaged 18%, and it never dropped below 14%. At its worst, in 1933, the unemployment rate was 25%. In that era, uh, the typical household had only one wage earner in it. So when we talk about one in four people being unemployed, we're really talking about one in four households in the country with no visible means of support, no reliable income. Today, the typical household has two wage earners in it. So even a 25% unemployment rate, God forbid that we should ever see it today, would not mean the same thing in human terms as it did in 1933. The Depression hit almost every sector of the economy. One third of American farmers lost their land from 1929 to 1932. Housing starts plunged by almost 90% between 1929 and 1933, and they wouldn't rebound for almost 15 years. The Dow Jones Industrial Average also plunged by almost 90%. Total wages dropped 60%. As we now measure it, more than half of all Americans were living in poverty. This was a desperate time for families because unemployment was so massive and, and so long-term, and because there were, was no effective source of relief for unemployed people during much of the 1930s. The most intimate areas of American life were affected. From 1929 to 1933, the marriage rate fell by 22%. Many young people could not afford to leave their parents and start their own households. At the same time, the divorce rate dropped by 25%. If you were already in a household, you couldn't afford to set up a second one. The birth rate declined by 15%. Another mouth to feed? Those numbers measure the hardship of the time, but they had a lasting impact. This crisis was so extreme that it brought forth powerful remedies. <laughs> 
I pledge myself to a new deal for the American people. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal introduced major federal programs for relief and recovery, many of which are still with us today. Social Security, unemployment insurance, aid to dependent children, the minimum wage, stock market regulation, federal deposit insurance for banks. The New Deal marked a radical change in the role of the federal government. Calvin Coolidge once said that uh, if the federal government went out of business tomorrow, the average American wouldn't notice the fact for at least six months, which was a pretty true statement, actually, because in the 1920s and before, uh, the federal government's role was essentially to deliver the mail and uh, service the national debt such as it was and make a few payments to veterans, and that was about it. Prior to the Great Depression, the public at large generally accepted the view that government was a problem, not a solution. The Great Depression changed that because it was so widely interpreted as reflecting a failure of the private enterprise system. And as a result, the attitude of the public toward government changed. It changed from believing it was a problem to believing that government was a solution to every problem. What did Americans of the 1930s think about the government's increased role in their lives? Previously, we would not have been able to answer that question with any certainty, but the mid-1930s saw the advent of another institution that boosted liberty and has stayed with us to the present day, the public opinion poll. In 1935, a new weekly column appeared in newspapers across the country. America Speaks promised to report what the public thought about the issues of the day through nationwide public opinion polls. The surveys were conducted by a Princeton, New Jersey company called the American Institute of Public Opinion, recently founded by George Gallup. The issues were wide-ranging, from manners and morals to the most profound debates about public policy. For example, was it indecent for women to wear shorts on the street in 1939? 63% of respondents said yes. What about topless bathing suits for men? Apparently they were okay, although 33% still found them indecent as late as 1939. Did Americans approve of a married woman working if she had a husband capable of supporting her? No, and by a wide margin, 78% disapproved in the Depression year of 1938. As for what Americans thought about the Depression and the New Deal, the poll offered some real surprises. For example, in retrospect, it's commonly thought that Franklin Roosevelt and his New Deal programs were wildly popular. But the very first Gallup poll question in 1935 was this. Do you think expenditures by the government for relief and recovery are too little, too great, or just about right? How do you think Depression-era America answered? Too little, 9%. About right, 31%. Too great, 60%. But just three months later, in December of 1935, Gallup was in the field again with this question. Are you in favor of government old age pensions for the needy? Yes, 89%. No, 11%. Americans wanted to have their cake and eat it too, and why not? It's a pattern that continues to the present day. Now, George Gallup did not invent the modern public opinion poll, but he is the man who legitimized it, thanks in part to a dramatic bet. In 1935, in order to get newspapers to subscribe to his weekly polls, 
Gallup promised he would predict the winner of the 1936 presidential election. He actually guaranteed the newspapers that were subscribing to his poll that if he was wrong, he would refund all their money. Now, that, that was a lot of polling that he had been doing that whole year, so for him to agree to refund the money if he was wrong was a real big gamble. And that was just part of the bet. Gallup also guaranteed that he would predict the percentages more accurately than the leading poll of the day, conducted by the Literary Digest magazine. It seemed a foolhardy promise. The Literary Digest poll had picked the winner in every presidential election since 1916. The Digest poll was conducted on a vast scale. A staff of several thousand workers stuffed ballots into envelopes, in some years as many as 20 million of them. The ballots were mailed to names pulled from automobile registration lists and telephone directories. As a matter of fact, they went to about a third of all households in the United States. Um, and the assumption was that more people you interview, of course, you're going to get more closer to the truth. But George Gallup knew that huge samples did not guarantee accuracy. The method he relied on was called quota sampling, a technique also used at the time by polling pioneers Archibald Crossley and Elmo Roper. The idea was to canvas groups of people who were representative of the electorate. Gallup sent out hundreds of interviewers across the country, each of whom was given quotas for different types of respondents. So many middle-class urban women, so many lower-class rural men, and so on. Gallup's team conducted some 3,000 interviews but nowhere near the 10 million poll that year by the Digest. So a lot of politicians at the time said, how can you believe George Gallup? I know the Literary Digest is polling because I know of people who've gotten the ballot, but I never see a George Gallup interviewer. Both predicted big wins, but for different candidates. The Digest predicted Republican Alf Landon would win handsomely with 57% of the vote to Roosevelt's 43%. Wrong, said Gallup. He forecast a win for Roosevelt with 54% of the vote. When election day arrived, voters filed into the voting booths and re-elected Roosevelt with an overwhelming 61% of the vote. George Gallup won his bet. How could Gallup be right and the Digest so wrong? The Digest's automobile registration lists and telephone directories were not representative samples. In the 1930s, while cars and telephones were becoming more widespread, they were still disproportionately owned by the middle and upper classes. That hadn't mattered much in previous elections. The voting patterns of rich and poor were similar. But in 1936, in the Depression, more prosperous Americans tended to vote Republican for Landon, and less prosperous voters tended to vote Democratic, favoring Roosevelt. Since Gallup's samples more closely matched the electorate as a whole, his numbers were less affected when the votes split along class lines. It was a turning point for Gallup and for polling. I would say that the 1936 election really put the, um, the so-called scientific pollsters on the map. Um, my father, George Gallup, Archibald Crosley, and Elmo Roper, because it was a very dramatic demonstration of the power of, of the, uh, rather the accuracy of scientific polling versus other kinds of surveys that relied on sheer numbers or, uh, you know, samples that weren't representative. The Literary Digest went out of business. Gallup became the leading evangelist for the new science of polling. In his 1940 book, The Pulse of Democracy, Gallup outlined a utopian view of its potential. Polling, he said, would become the national equivalent of the New England town meeting. It would give a voice to the views of the common man. <laughs> 
My dad thought that uh, polls were absolutely vital to a democracy. He felt that polls were extremely important because they removed the power from lobbying groups and from smoke-filled rooms and, and let, let the public into the act. It was a way to, to let the public speak. I think he'd still say, if he were around, he'd say, although it's being overdone now, you still have to know where the public is. I mean, this is what a democracy is about. Without it, what do you have? Has Gallup's vision been realized? We are told politicians aren't leaders anymore, they just echo polls. But for all its flaws, public opinion polling is a great American contribution to democracy. Would you rather live in an America where politicians don't know what's on the mind of the public? Barely half of Americans vote for the president, while public opinion polls theoretically represent the views of all citizens. Polling helps give democracy a voice which was what Gallup had in mind. When we come back in a moment, we will see democracy itself under the gun during the greatest calamity of the century. To order the first measured century on video cassette or the 300-page companion reference book, call PBS Home Video at 1-800-PLAY-PBS. You're watching PBS. He explored the darkest chapters of our nation's history in the Civil Retirement plan services. T. Rowe Price. Invest with confidence. T. Rowe Price Investment Services Incorporated. We're Pfizer. We're looking for the cures of the future. Spending about four and a half billion dollars a year in search of new medicines for the 21st century. Pfizer. Life is our life's work. The Lind and Harry Bradley Foundation. The Bernard and Irene Schwartz Foundation. The John M. Olin Foundation, the Smith Richardson Foundation, the D&D &D Foundation. By the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome back. In Act One, we saw the close of the American frontier, an immigrant wave, the new uses of social science and politics, a free market economic boom and America's worst economic crisis. It would get worse before it got better. Like so much that transpired in America in the 20th century, World War II was at its root about liberty, preserving it, defending it, reinstating it, expanding it around the world where it was directly threatened and in America where it was not. Let's pick up the story. As the 1940s began, America was still struggling to emerge from a depression that had already stretched to a full decade. The New Deal programs may well have cushioned the blow, but did not end the crisis, not by a long shot. Nonetheless, the American people continue to display a characteristic optimism. A Roper poll for Fortune magazine showed that 71% of respondents 
thought the country would return to an era of expansion and opportunity. But many intellectuals were much more pessimistic. Just as a, an earlier generation of Americans at the end of the 19th century had thought that the, the closing of the frontier, the end of the frontier, had closed a major chapter in American history, so too did many people in the 1930s think that the Depression marked the end of an economic era, the end of an era of growth. The economy had matured was the way that they described it, and they thought it was not very likely that it would ever again grow at the rate that it had for the preceding century or so. But then something happened. Sixteen million Americans went off to fight, one out of every nine Americans. 400,000 of them would lose their lives. Worldwide, 80 million people were killed. But for America, the Second World War was also an engine of huge social and economic change for the better. It's kind of a terrible irony, in a way, that the solution to America's problems was World War II. The war did what all the New Deal programs of the 1930s had failed to do, end the Depression. Factories long idle, plants running at a fraction of capacity, now geared up for flat-out wartime production. At its peak, the United States rolled out a ship every day and an airplane every five minutes. All that production put money in people's pockets. Suddenly, everyone was working. In 1938, the unemployment rate was 19%. In 1944, it was 1%. Except for those who served in battle, the war was probably the best thing that had happened to the American people in the 20th century. For those at home, it meant unprecedented prosperity. Income levels had never been as high at any point in history before that time. We were the only belligerent country, the only country that fought World War II, that managed to increase its standard of living, its civilian standard of living, even while it was fighting the war. In this country, we had more guns and more butter, too. The war set people in motion. Defense plants in the industrial north and far west became magnets for huge migrations of job seekers from the south and east. From 1940 to 1950, eight million people moved to the west coast, the largest westward migration in American history. One historian has described it as, it's as if some great hand reached down and tipped the whole continent westward and people just slid especially from the Midwest and the South to the West Coast, which nearly doubled its population in the war. You might say the war was a kind of demographic cauldron in which the American people were churned as they hadn't been probably for a hundred years since they first burst across the Appalachian Crest in the early 19th century. The wartime demand for labor bowled over some long-standing barriers. In a wartime address, President Roosevelt said this, in some communities, employers dislike to employ women. In others, they are reluctant to hire Negroes. We can no longer afford to indulge such prejudices or practices. On the eve of World War II, three out of four African Americans still lived in the South, the poorest people in the nation's poorest region. Nationally, they were more likely than whites to work in unskilled jobs for lower pay, 39% of what whites earned. By today's standards, almost nine out of 10 were below the federal poverty threshold. And due to Jim Crow segregation laws, less than 5% of eligible blacks in states of the old Confederacy could vote. At first, it looked like the war wouldn't change much of that. At the beginning, blacks were excluded from the Army Air Corps and the Marines. In the Navy, they could only serve as 
kitchen staff. The Army accepted blacks, but they could only serve in segregated units commanded by white officers. Many defense plants did not want to hire blacks. But in 1941, A. Philip Randolph, president of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, threatened to have 100,000 blacks march on Washington to protest job discrimination. The very idea of having a march on Washington during uh, the war was a really a very important symbolic change in the way that blacks were addressing the problems of race in America. President Roosevelt yielded to Randolph's demand. He issued Executive Order 8802, prohibiting discrimination in defense jobs or government. The lure of well-paid jobs pulled blacks out of the South and into the war plants in the North and West, 700,000 blacks during the course of the war. In the peak year of 1943, 10,000 blacks per month arrived in Los Angeles alone. Black women who had earned $3.50 a week as domestic servants back in the South found themselves making $48 a week in the aircraft plants of Los Angeles. By the war's end, African Americans held almost 8% of all defense industry jobs, not far from their proportion of the total population. The number of blacks working for the federal government more than tripled. What it meant was that blacks gradually developed a working class population. Prior to this time, they were overwhelmingly impoverished. But after uh, World War II, uh, you saw the gradual development of a black working class. And so the entry into these um, goods producing industries was a, a stepping stone into higher status. The gains were not just economic. When blacks migrated seeking better jobs, they left the Jim Crow South far behind. The blacks now moved to places in the country where they could vote, which they could not do in any appreciable numbers in the segregated uh, pre-World War II South. The war's impact on blacks is reflected in the numbers. Between 1940 and 1950, the black population of Mississippi went down by 8%. The black population of Michigan went up by 112%. California, up 272 percent. In 1939, black males earned 41 percent of what white males earned. In 1947, they earned 54 percent of what white males earned. The war also created new opportunities for women now desperately needed to keep defense plants running. Today, most of us are familiar with the story of Rosie the Riveter. Anecdotal histories and government propaganda have made Rosie the symbol of wartime working women. All the day long, where the rain or shine, she's a part of the assembly line. She's making history, working for victory. Rosie the Riveter. But just how typical was Rosie? The Rosie the Riveter image was an exaggerated image. It was typical of a few women, and it was perhaps how most women imagined themselves, even as they were doing dreary work. But in fact, it was an exaggerated image. Rosie, 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 working on assembly line. The numbers give a sense of proportion. Nearly two million women worked in defense plants during the war half a million in the aircraft industry alone. 225,000 women worked in shipbuilding. That's a lot. But these women never made up more than 10% of the total female workforce of 19 million. If you look at the whole distribution of what women were doing in wartime, you might say the typical uh, woman war worker was, should be called Sally the secretary, or in fact, maybe even Molly the mom because most women persisted in their traditional functions during the war. 
The biggest difference was in who those working women were. Before the war, women who worked were typically young and single. That began to change. Thanks to the wartime labor shortage, working women were more likely to be middle-aged and married. In 1940, 36 percent of working women were married. In 1944, 46 percent were married. In 1940, 43 percent of working women were 35 or older. By 1944, that number had jumped to 62 percent. World War II had one other very significant benefit for the United States. When the war ends, the United States is the only first-class economy left in the world. It's the only one. And it retains that position for oh, 10, 15 years after the war. So you couldn't ask for a better start to peacetime for Americans. It's goodbye to the Army for these G.I. Joes at Fort Dix, New Jersey. 1945, World War II ended. Johnny came marching home again. The GIs invaded America. But beneath the homecomings and the hoopla, there was deep concern. What would happen to those 10 million veterans now returning to civilian life? Even as the war raged, government planners had gloomy visions of millions of vets standing in depression-scale unemployment lines. Then in March of 1944, Congress passed and the president signed a critical piece of legislation. In the presence of senators, congressmen, and the heads of veterans' organizations, President Roosevelt signs G.I. Joe's Bill of Rights. The GI Bill, ironically, was originally conceived as a way to ease the transition of uh, demobilized veterans back into the economy, because many people feared that the, 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 the Depression of the 30s would return after the war. So some device had to be found to slow down the return to the workforce of these uh, veterans. Uh, but ironically, the way the GI Bill actually played out was a tremendous bonus to their uh, skill level their educational level, which in turn fueled the productivity of the economy in the post-war era. Almost 8 million veterans received educational benefits via the GI Bill. Many went to trade schools or job training, and more than 2 million went to college. From 1930 to 1950, the number of college degrees granted in America went up three and a half times from 122,000 to 432,000. Most of them at the time regarded this as three lost years, just taken away. And so instead of doing things in sequence, they did them all at once. They went to college, became engaged, got married, and started having children all at the same time. With their new wives and newer families, veterans arrived on college campuses in overwhelming numbers. At the University of Minnesota in 1947, of 30,000 students, 60% were veterans and a third of those were married. At colleges across the country, married vets lived in on-campus housing with names like Vetsburg or Fertile Acres. Much of the veterans' housing was makeshift military, but the company they kept in their new barracks was clearly an improvement. In college or out, veterans were marrying and starting families. In 1946, there were almost half again as many marriages as in 1940, which led very quickly to the baby boom. Just nine months after demobilization, the number of births began to soar to 2.9 million per year and kept on soaring. Demographers had expected a baby boom when the wartime separations ended, but this one just didn't stop. The Energizer Bunny just kept going and going and going. Over the course of 18 years, from 1946 to 1964, 
76 million American babies were born. At its peak in 1957, a dozen years after the war, the total fertility rate topped out at 3.8 children per woman. That's higher than the current rate in the less developed third world countries. The baby boom was monumental, but it was more than just an event. It is a process that will take 100 years to play out from cradle to grave. In the years immediately following the war, the baby boom posed a problem. Where would all those growing families live? For 15 years, thanks to the Depression and World War II, there had been virtually no new housing built in the United States. So that by 1947, you have millions of husbands and wives and children living together, bunched up, crunched in with their in-laws. That was my situation. Four kids. I remember sleeping in a dining room. People were taking any kind of a place that had a roof over it and a wall around it as a place to live. Today, the ingenious veteran who has managed to find even a barge or a houseboat for his family may count himself lucky, despite the special problems involved in commuting. I think that we have never experienced in American history the kind of pinup demand for housing that existed about 1947, 1948. Again, the GI Bill was a key part of the solution. It allowed veterans to buy a home with no money down. What's more, it guaranteed the loans, removing the risk for lenders. In a housing boom to end all housing booms, builders responded. Lakewood, California, 15 miles south of Los Angeles. In 1950, this was called the fastest growing housing development in the world. On one day, 100 homes were sold in one hour. Builders here started 50 houses a day. Cement trucks waited in a mile-long line to pour foundations for low-cost housing. Within just three years, the empty farmland around Lakewood had grown to a city of 90,000 people. Nationwide, housing starts soared from a low of only one per thousand people in the war year of 1944 to a high of 12 per thousand in 1950, a number not equaled since. By 1950, the same assembly line methods that had turned out an airplane every five minutes during the war were used to build almost four new houses per minute. We are making on the order of two million houses, new starts per year, and about 95% of them are fully detached single family houses. The second thing to remember about it is they're affordable. Quite literally, you could buy a house in the 1950s cheaper than you could rent it. In some ways, if we look at the whole history of the world, what's been unusual about America, the United States, has been that the single family house has been available and affordable to the average person, more so than in any other land, save possibly Australia and Canada. In 1940, only two Americans in five owned their own homes. By 1950, it was more than half, and by the end of the 1950s boom, home ownership had climbed to 61%. Today, two out of every three Americans own their own homes. Increasingly, those homes are in the suburbs. 12% in 1910, about a third in 1960, and today, a majority of Americans live in the suburbs. You have sort of a national ethos that celebrates the single family house. We believe in it. We're not like, let's say, the Spanish or the Italians or the Germans or the Japanese who love urban life. It's not surprising that we become essentially the world's greatest suburban nation. This, too, was liberty and individualism at work, a freestanding private home of your own on land that you own. Now, these days, suburbia has its critics. It's sprawl, they say. 
But hey, have you ever heard anyone say, a man's apartment is his castle? In the years following the war, there were also criticisms of the suburbs and of the people who lived in them. The book, The Crack in the Picture Window by John Keats was somewhat typical, complaining that the suburbs were boring places with no culture, where a homogeneous group of conformists lived in ticky-tacky homes, one looking exactly like the other. The American people were not buying the criticisms. They were voting with their feet, moving to the suburbs. This is probably the stupidest vein of social criticism ever developed in the history of social criticism, so far as I can tell, because who are they talking about? They are talking about the greatest generation. The guys who won World War II were the ones who are buying these houses and living in the subdivisions. They're the same people. So how can they be uh, cowering conformists and, and uh, people lacking any convictions of their own? In one decade, in the earlier decade, they're the greatest generation. No, they're the same people. And they have the same aspirations that Americans have always had. And what, pray tell, were the American people doing in those homes? Today, if you want to know about sex in America, and even if you don't, the information is hard to avoid. Just look at the magazines at any newsstand or supermarket checkout line, and you will find intimate sexual behavior examined in great detail. And so too, of course, on television. Yet, not long ago, such public discussion and display of sex was limited. The naked truth about how Americans behave was unknown. It was the last dark frontier of social science until a controversial Midwestern biology professor named Alfred Kinsey walked into America's bedroom and snapped on the light. Ooh, ooh, Dr. Kinsey. Ooh, ooh, Dr. Kinsey. Few books have had greater impact on American society than the two volumes written by Alfred Kinsey. Sexual Behavior in the Human Male hit the bookstores in 1948, selling a quarter of a million copies in the first year alone. Sexual Behavior in the Human Female was published in 1953. Together, they comprised the first major scientific study of American sexuality, containing data from interviews with 5,300 men and 5,900 women covering most every aspect of their sexual histories. What happens when Kinsey publishes the male volume and the female volume is that American society gets permission to talk about sex. Uh, you can go in boardrooms, you can go in barbershops, you can go in cafes, you can go on sidewalk street corners, and people are talking about issues that they never would have talked about before. Alfred Kinsey says X number of people masturbate. Alfred Kinsey says X number of men have premarital intercourse. And people have permission, really, by science, uh, the great uh, secular force in our society, to open these questions to discussion. Some readers were shocked, others comforted. Some attacked the accuracy of the data, for according to Kinsey, there was a wide gap between what people thought was normal and what people were actually doing. Since I've read your report, I'm disillusioned as can be. For example, premarital sex was reported by two out of every three college-educated males and almost all males with only a grade school education. More surprisingly, about half of all females said they had sex before marriage. What about extramarital sex? Kinsey maintained that about half of all married males and one quarter of married females had strayed from the marital bed at some point in their lives. The data on male homosexuality was most shocking and immediately challenged. Kinsey reported that 37% of males had at least one homosexual experience to the point of orgasm. What's more, 
10% of males in the sample were predominantly homosexual for at least three years. About 4% were said to be exclusively homosexual for life. The two books made Kinsey an international celebrity, both praised and vilified. Some regarded the works as a clarion call for personal liberation. Others saw them as precursors of promiscuity. Publicly, Kinsey always maintained that he had no social agenda and that what drove him was science for science's sake. Pure research depends upon the sort of objectivity which gathers data and allows other people to use those data. But as more has come to be known about the private Kinsey and his passions, both social and sexual, it has become clear that there was more to Kinsey than his scientific stance. Kinsey is at odds with the way society regulates human sexual behavior. And what he wants to see is a much more encompassing ethic of tolerance that will make a room at the table for lots of different kinds of people who don't fit under the cookie cutters of prescribed morality. You know, he was, uh, he was trying to make the world a, a more tolerant and happier place. But you'd never get him to admit that. <laughs> Kinsey was born in 1894 in New Jersey, where he grew up under the stern guidance of a very religious father. Yeah, you got the impression that everything connected with sex was uh, dangerous and sinful. And bad. so he suffered a great deal as a, as a child. You know, he, he thought if he, his masturbation would drive him insane or stunt his growth or that he'd go to hell because of it, and that kind of business. And he often said, I, I, I'd like to see it that no child ever went through this nonsense that I had to go through. Kinsey was probably motivated by his adult sex life as well. He remained happily married to his wife, Clara, to the end of his life. But over the years, he also had sexual relations with men and engaged in sadomasochism. Kinsey's private life was uh, at odds with his public persona. Publicly, Ken Kinsey presented the image of a very staid uh, Midwest University professor, uh, family man. Privately, he's also a person who pushes the envelope uh, with regard to uh, experimentation uh, with behavior. Kinsey's research methods went beyond interviewing. He and a photographer filmed various animals copulating. Less openly, in the privacy of the attic of his own home, Kinsey filmed human sexual behavior, including masturbation, hetero and homosexual intercourse, and sadomasochism. We tried to anticipate Masters and Johnson a little bit. For example, if we could have some in sexual, someone masturbating or in sexual intercourse, you know, maybe one of us would be trying to hold a finger on their pulse to count the pulse, and somebody else might be trying to count the respiration. Uh, we, that was very primitive. That's all we could do. And so instead of, these weren't exactly orgies. Some of these were pretty, pretty medically inclined. The sessions involved members of Kinsey's team and their wives, trusted volunteers, and occasionally Kinsey himself. Kinsey's wife, Clara, made the participants feel right at home. Images I have of uh, Clara that's really, you know, you know, quite sweet is that people will be involved in the attic uh, with all kinds of uh, sexual, sexual acts and she'll come in with milk and cookies and towels for them to, you know, dry off and, and freshen up and then uh, milk and cookies and then the next round of, you know, behavior will begin. But even if the private Kinsey was a sexual experimenter and a covert crusader for what he considered sexual tolerance, the key questions remain. Does it matter? Did it lead him to slant his data? Kinsey would never, it's just not part of his makeup, would never have knowingly doctored the books. With Kinsey, though, his desire to change attitudes to have people be tolerant is something that shapes his writing. It's something that really molds his presentation of data. Case in point, the data on homosexuality. Kinsey reported what he found, but his sample included adolescent boys who engaged in group masturbation. 
No, a lot of this came about in the early post-puberty. So yeah, for three years in there, they were much more homosexual than heterosexual. And Kinsey had just put that out as a kind of to emphasize what he felt was to show the, the degree to which homosexuality was prevalent. There were also problems with Kinsey's statistical procedures. His methodology was derived from his previous biological field work on the gall wasp. Kinsey had roamed far and wide across the United States and Central America collecting tens of thousands of samples of the wasps. He takes that same approach of huge samples, vast geographical expanses, a dogged pursuit of every specimen that he can locate, and he just transfers it bodily to the study of human sexual behavior, never doubting that if he collects enough and does it in enough different places, he'll put together a portrait of human sexuality that starts to look like the truth. And so Kinsey and his team crisscrossed America, from California to the Carolinas, from campus co-eds to gay hustlers and prostitutes in Times Square. He interviewed many prisoners, including sex offenders at San Quentin, whose incidence of homosexuality was substantially higher than average. As a means of portraying the vast range of human sexual behavior, Kinsey's approach was fine, but it was less useful in generalizing about the population as a whole. In the first book, Kinsey made an attempt to generalize, to extrapolate to the general population, and he realized later that was a mistake. He changed his mind, and he decided, we'll not do that. How have Kinsey's results held up? After the mail volume was released, the American Statistical Association sent a blue ribbon panel to Bloomington to examine the data. They had criticisms, but their report was largely favorable. In later years, a reanalysis of Kinsey's data by researchers John Gagnon and William Simon reported that some of the percentages on homosexuality were overstated and not representative of the American public as a whole. Kinsey had oversampled prison populations and included teenage incidents. His exclusively homosexual calculation, however, was not far off the mark, according to Gagnon and Simon, whose estimate is 3% as opposed to Kinsey's 4%. Kinsey's data may forever remain controversial, but whatever the debate over his statistics, there is no denying the tremendous impact that Alfred Kinsey had on America at mid-century. When we talk about Kinsey's validity, you know, the numbers to me are less important than the impact of the work as a piece of social reform. I think Kinsey's work precipitates the most sustained and the highest level discussion of human sexuality up to that point in American history. And out of that discussion will come a review of social policy, will, be, will come a review of sex offender codes, will come a review of gender roles, will come a review of the place of gays in American society. And to the extent that Kinsey forces the public to reevaluate and to accept science as an arbiter of these issues, uh, to that extent, he changes American society. Has sexual behavior changed since Kinsey? Premarital sex? Up. Oh, it's estimated that three out of four women have had sex before marriage. Extramarital sex? Down. Kinsey reported 50% of men and 26% of women, but that included couples separated by the war. The numbers in the 1990s were 25% of men and 15% of women. Homosexuality, no real change. Kinsey estimated the range at three to 6% of men and three to 8% of women. The 1990 data, three to 5% of men and roughly 4% of women. Over the course of the century, American women had been gradually moving into the workforce. At the height of World War II, Norman Rockwell captured the spirit of America's working women with this robust take 
on an American icon, Rosie the Riveter. After the war, Rosie the Riveter, Sally the Secretary, and many others went back home. But soon, women would return to work in larger numbers than ever before, and America would never be the same. I think the wartime experience had an impact on women. It raised expectations of what life could be like. It made it possible for them to imagine uh, dual roles, both inside the home and outside uh, the home. Uh, it made it uh, possible for them to imagine